you would, open your Bibles to Luke chapter 11 this morning, Luke chapter 11, and uh, we're going to learn how to pray. Um, We've been walking through the book of Luke. Uh, We've learned a ton. Uh, Last week, Pastor Dave preached on the story of Mary and Martha, a very famous story. Mary and Martha are encouraged to uh, drop the chores, drop the to-do list, drop the worry, drop the whatever they got going on and go to the feet of Jesus and learn. And now in Luke chapter 11, we're going to see the disciples coming to Jesus. And where is he? He's at the feet of the Father. He's praying. He's at the Father's feet praying and learning. And so just as the disciples were supposed to be at Jesus' feet, Jesus is at the Father's feet in prayer. And I'm going to need you to definitely take some notes, write these things down. Um, I'm going to give you a, 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 a um, kind of a structure for your prayer life. The Lord's Prayer is not a prayer that we memorize and then just rehearse over and over. Um, the Lord's Prayer is a structured four-part prayer, and you can use this in your everyday life. So we'll start in Luke chapter 11, verse 1. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord... Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. Yeah, fair question. They come on Jesus. Jesus is praying. Hey, Jesus, teach me to pray. I'd like to pray too. This isn't new news to anyone here, but Jesus prayed. He prayed with people. He prayed before meals. He prayed before decisions. He prayed after a busy day. He made it a point to often go alone and pray. The early church prayed. Acts chapter 2, we find Christians praying. Acts chapter 6, we see that the leaders in the church are getting so busy that they delegate tasks out because they say the most important thing they can do is what? Preach the word and pray. In the church age, we're commanded to pray. Colossians 4, continue steadfastly in prayer. Ephesians 6, praying at all times. James 5, is anyone among you suffering? Let him Pray, Matthew 5, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. 1 Thessalonians 5, pray without ceasing. We're supposed to pray. We're commanded to pray. Jesus prayed. His disciples prayed. We need to pray. How do we pray? So we're going to take our four-point sermon here. We're going to write these down. I'm going to give you a structure on how to pray. Let's start in Luke 11, verse 2. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father... Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. If you know the Lord's Prayer, it's, this is a truncated version, but it's essentially the same thing, and it falls into four parts. I want to give you the four parts today. I need you to write these four parts down, and then I need you to figure out a way to do this. Because so often in our life, our prayer life typically is, God help, God I need some help, God I need, God I want, help me in this situation, they're very short, kind of help me kind of prayers, and that's not how we should always be praying. We can certainly sometimes say, God I need your help right now. But that's not the model that Jesus uses and gives to us. And I think we need to write these down and start using this structure because it's going to round out your prayer life. Point number one, Luke 11, 2a. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. So the first part of the Lord's prayer is an upward part. It's upward because it's full of worship. Certainly there are times when you can say, help me, give me, help me, I need, please help. But that shouldn't define your entire prayer life. Lord, I'm in a jam right now, isn't the only prayer that you can pray. There are others. Jesus starts with the holiness of God. He starts with the worship of God. Why would he do that? Dr. Daniel Henderson says this, There's a big difference between seeking the hand of God and seeking the face of God. So don't forget that. So often when we're praying to God, we're seeking his hand and we're not always seeking his face. 
Seeking the hand of God means God is giving you something. He's answering something. You're crying out, you have a need, and God has the answer, and you want him to give it to you. Seeking the face of God means that you're simply seeking a time where you can be with the Father. Just be with him. Just enjoy him. How many of you parents out there love it when your kids only come to you when they have a need? I'm sure you absolutely love that. Now, do you like it when your kids come to you with a need? Absolutely, I do. Just not all the time. It would be nice every now and again if a kid came to you and said, hey, Dad, what do you need? I just want to hang out with you. Just want to be around you. Now, if, if I, as an earthly wicked father, would desire that, certainly our heavenly father would desire that too. We worship God. We take some time to focus on him, to say things that are true about him. We honor God. We rehearse his greatness. We spend time with him before we move on to the rest of our prayer. If you're struggling with this, I would say if you had a, a quiet time, a, a prayer time, you could open up uh, the book of Psalms and read a psalm. Just read a psalm out loud. Read a psalm to yourself. Something that is praise and glory to God. Just start there. Or as you prayer walk or as you're prayer sitting or wherever, you're, wherever you pray, begin to just say, Father, you are holy and right and good. You are loving. You are full of mercy and grace. You are full of compassion. And just talk to God about who he is and just spend that time sitting with the Father. Not immediately saying, I need, I want, I desire. Point number two. Luke 11, 2b, the second half. Your kingdom come. What does that mean? First part of the prayer is upward. The second part of the prayer is downward. The kingdom of God is something that is still breaking through, right? It's still breaking through the personal work of Jesus Christ. So God is over all. He is in all. He's through all. He is the king of all. But we don't always see him being the king of all here on earth. We see wickedness. We see evil. We see destruction. We see bad. We see sin. We get hurt. We hurt others. That's not right under the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God will avail itself here on earth one day, correct? So as we're, I shared this with the men, as you're hearing the news and Israel and war, what I'm getting really tired of are uh, well-meaning Christians who think that because Israel's at war, somehow that's a sign that Jesus or the rapture or the tribulation or second coming is more imminent than it was yesterday. It ain't more imminent than it was yesterday. Don't confuse the rapture and the second coming. The rapture and the second coming are separated by a seven-year time of tribulation. We are looking forward to the rapture. And no amount of anything that happens here on earth. Things could get rosy. Things could get bad. A nuke could get dropped or everybody be at peace. And Jesus' words will still hold true that he is coming to get the saints. And he doesn't know the, know the time, nor do we know the time. Not knowing the time of the rapture means this. Nothing can happen here on earth where you go, oh, there's a clue. I'm supposed to start guessing dates. So we're just, we're just all regular people. We're all regular Christians. And we're all waiting for the rapture. After the rapture, the tribulation. After the tribulation, the second coming of Jesus where he touches down here on earth and rules for a thousand years and his kingdom will have no end. His kingdom will be established here on earth. So when you're praying this prayer, you're saying that kingdom where Jesus is ruling, where everything is just and right and set right and perfect and wonderful, that's the kind of kingdom I want now. Your kingdom come. And his kingdom comes through the person and work of Jesus Christ. If the first uh, part of the, uh, of, the, of the Lord's Prayer was summarized by worship, this part would be summarized by surrender. I want to surrender to what it looks like to have his kingdom here. I can't vote his kingdom in. It doesn't work that way. Jesus 
is king. He's king where? He's king in my heart. And if you're a Christian this morning, he's a king in your heart too. Which means if he's the king of your heart, you have got to bow the knee to him and actually follow him. When you go to home, when you go to work, when you're dealing with a child, when you're dealing with an adult, whoever you're talking to in whatever situation you're at, you're saying, I have, as a child of the king, I want to bring this kingdom to rule and to bear in the situation that I'm living. I will treat people the way that Jesus would treat them. And so when we say, your kingdom come, my fear is that my entire prayer life is my kingdom come. Because all my prayers are about my kingdom. Lord, I want this and I want this. I want you to smoke that person. I want you to give grace to this person. I want you to save this person. I want you to grow. I want you to give. I want you to bless. I want you to do this. I want to, I want my eyes back because now I can't see my notes. I want, I want, I want and health and good and my kids and my wife and mine and my stuff and my car not to break down and my house not to leak and who's, I am guilty of that as my prayer life. I am guilty of that. That if you summarized a bunch of my prayer life, it would be, Father God, thank you for my kingdom. I just want to pray right now for all the things in my kingdom. I have a very uh, small kingdom right now. I'd like to have a large kingdom. And I'd like to begin to pray about the things that are in my kingdom. Is that untrue? Well, it's a lot different to spend some time worshiping God, and then say, your kingdom come. Which puts me as a servant of the king instead of me telling the king his business. They're radically different. What would that look like in your life if you began to change your prayers to, God, show me your kingdom and where you're working. What are you doing? I want to jump on board with what you're doing. I don't always need to be about my business. Part three, Luke 11, three to four A. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. The third part of the Lord's prayer is inward. Upward, Father, you are holy. Downward, your kingdom come. May your kingdom rule here. And next, inward. The inward part contains requests. The first two half of the Lord's prayer had no requests. He spent a bunch of time praying and didn't ask the Father of anything. And now we begin at the third part to get requests. The first Two sections of the Lord's Prayer, none, and now requests. We've got two sections here. Give us each day our daily bread. The first request is for resources. Now, the last time I checked the Bible, the Bible promises me that God will do what? He will provide for me. You don't need to cheat. You don't need to steal. You don't need to take a job where you sell your soul to the devil. You can pay your taxes the right way. You can honor God. You can make an honest living. You can work hard. You do not need to cheat. And you certainly don't need to be taking jobs where you work on Sunday. If that's a thing that's required of you before you take that job, don't take the job. You honor God. You are a servant of the Most High God. You honor him first and foremost, and he will honor you. He will provide for you, just as the lilies in the field, just as the bird, just as the, he will provide. Everyone in this room can attest to God providing for you above and beyond. I know I can. That's a promise, and yet in the Lord's prayer, it's a request. Now that's fascinating to me. On the one hand, God promises to provide for you. On the other hand, in the Lord's prayer, a very short prayer, he requests, give us each day our daily bread. To me, what this tells me is that God wants to hear from his children. 
He just wants to hear from you. He wants to talk to you. He wants to listen to you. He wants to speak through to you. So when I ask for my daily bread, it's like I'm coming to my father and just talking to him about the resources that I need. Some of you need more resources. You do. And it's okay to ask for those resources. If your job is not providing for you, begin to ask God for more resources. My only question of you is this. Are you diligent and faithful with the current resources that God has given you? If you're not, then stop asking for more resources and start being uh, 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 faithful with the resources that God has given you. That means you save some money, you give to the local church, you help others, you pay your bills, you don't need a Starbucks every day if you're not giving to the Lord. I don't believe God is going to honor that request. I really don't. I believe God will say, I've given you a certain amount of resources. You need to faithfully steward those resources and then begin to ask for more. He who is, I don't know, I'm going to make this up right now. He who is faithful in a little can be given more. It's a real verse in the Bible. I mean, it's a literal verse. What does it mean? It definitely doesn't mean that. It means that if I have a little, I should spend every penny I make plus charge on my credit cards and then complain to God that he doesn't give me more. That's what it must mean. It must not mean that I need to be faithful with a little and then receive more. It must not mean that. And by the way, we're coming to a dreaded season now, which is Christmas. Not dreaded in our hope and joy, but dreaded in our finances. For the love of God, I'm begging you. You don't need to charge thousands of dollars worth of gifts to say to your children, I love you. And most of your kids will grab the toy, go awesome, and it's just gone. It's just gone. Would you put yourself on a budget, please? Stop living paycheck to paycheck. Stop living in debt. That's the lust of the eyes. It's the lust of the flesh. It's the boastful pride of life. Live under your means. Give money away. Give to the local church. It's all commanded in scripture. The second request is really hard. He says, and forgive us our sins. I like that part. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Wow. So now we've got the request for relationships. Resources, relationships. Let me promise you this. Wherever you stand right now, however many relationships you have, however the relationships are going, I don't know. But let me promise you, let me promise you this. If you cannot repent of your sin to another party, and you cannot forgive another party, you will have no good relationships left in your life. They'll, they'll all be damaged, broken, and gone. It'll all be gone. Here's the great thing about all of us. We're really wicked sinners, and we like to bash heads like rams up in the mountains. And we just bash, and we just hurt, and, and we all do it. And the great news is, we all do it. None of us holds the higher ground over another party. The only one who holds the higher ground over all of us is who? God the Father, who is perfect. And so some of you in your prayer, in your prayer life, you've got to start taking time repenting of your sins and forgiving people who have sinned against you. That doesn't mean the relationship is restored, does it? There's a big difference between me releasing someone and saying they sinned against me. I've got to let it go. I forgive them because the Father has forgiven me. But that doesn't mean I got to go have lunch with them. It just doesn't work that way. That other party at some point has to repent of their sin, come to you, 
make it right, and prove that they want a real relationship. It is not your job as a Christian to go, I forgive you, now we're good, I get run over again. I forgive you, now we're good, I get run over again. I forgive you, now we're good, I get run over again. At some point, the other party has to change. They have to do something different. But you, you, so here's how we read this verse. I, we read this and I'm like, oh, it's my job to rebuke people. Cool, I'm super good at that. <laughs> it's my job to point out my spouse's sin. It's my job to point out other people's sin. It's my job to hold things over people's head. It's my job to do, to be God. It's not your job to be God. It's simply your job to do what? Two things. Repent of your sin. And two, what? Forgive. I would be lying to you if I said that that was easy. It's going to take some hard work. I promise you that. It's going to take some work. If we were to summarize this, it would be request. What a loving heavenly father we have that says, go ahead and request things of me. I'm listening. I love you. Part four, Luke 11, 4b. And lead us not into temptation. If I was to summarize this, it'd be like readiness. So here's the problem with the current world we live in. I don't know how many people can pray and lead us not into temptation because the current world we live in says that evil is good and good is evil. And, and the flow of society is running so quickly to evil that they can't actually pray a prayer that says, Give me, get me away from the evil because they're too busy running to it. And many of us in this room at various times are also busy running to the evil. We're lonely. And so we make decisions on how to solve our loneliness in the flesh. We're poor or we have a problem or an issue. And we're so tired of waiting on God that we're going to take these things in our own hands and we're going to lead ourselves into temptation and we're just going to do evil. The Christian who prays this is essentially saying, Father, I don't want to be around evil. I don't want a part of my life. Get me away from it. Put me in a place where I'm not being tempted. Put me in a, in a safe place. Keep me safe, Father. Verse 5. And he said to them, which of you has a friend who will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut. My children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. This is weird. God's comparing himself to this guy in a town whose door is being knocked on at midnight. Have your, has your door ever been knocked on at midnight? Super frustrating. Don't blame the guy. I would answer through ring and say, leave me alone. So in that day and age, uh, visitors would arrive whenever. So they didn't have cell phones back then? In, in like, <laughs> in 30, um, they didn't have cell phones. So they, nobody could be like, we are arriving at 5.06 now. We are supposed to arrive at 5. We'll be six minutes late for dinner. Just giving you a heads up. Don't want to inconvenience you too much. So they were like, the donkey broke down, the, the, the thing, and then the thing, and then robbers hit us. And they don't know. You don't know when the journey ends. They're just on a journey. Yep, grandma and grandpa are coming down. When are they going to be? I don't know. A few days? Week? I don't know. How do I know? I'm not God. I don't know if they fell. I don't know if they got hurt. I don't, know, I don't know what happened. And they just arrive at midnight. They just arrive. And then in that day and age, whoever, whoever arose, uh, arrived at your home, if you were not ready for them, that was a sign of, of being inhospitable. And, and that would have been like a, a, a huge hit to you. In that society, everyone would have had to help everyone. You would have known who had some bread or who baked that day or who might. And so you would go around and you would borrow things from people and you would get the help from your community. One of the hugest blessings of living in America is I don't need you. 
And one of the hugest, hugest disasters of America is I don't need you. Your greatest strength will be your greatest weakness. We have food. We got bread. It's in the freezer. All in thought. We can get in our car and go get food. We could, do... I mean, honestly, most of us in this room live like, I don't need anybody else. And in fact, that's a sign of strength. That me and my family are covered. I got, how many refrigerators do I have? Three? I have three refrigerators. We good. I don't need to knock on your, on your house at midnight. And that very thing is undermining the church. We do need one another. We need to love one another and be compassionate towards one another and be hospitable towards one another. We need to talk more. We need to probably borrow more and help more than we currently do. And so he knocks and knocks and, and, the, and the friend's like, nah. And remember, this is a comparison on God. So here's the picture. The picture is that if you keep knocking, you get it. You get what you wanted. You get what you needed. Well, that's weird. Let's follow this up. Verse 9. And I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. The one who knocks, it will be open. Wow. So Jesus is saying, there's three words, ask, seek, knock. Keep asking, seek, keep knocking, keep seeking, and it will be given to you. Keep at it. Be patient. God has not forgotten about you. Now, lest we go too far off the rails, God also has the right to say, no. How many of you have had a son or daughter beg you for something, and it was actually a bad thing? It wasn't going to help them. It wasn't the thing that they needed. And you know this. If you gave them the thing they were asking for, it would have damned them. You've all lived that. You've all had that moment where you're like, I love my son. I love my daughter. But if I give this to them, that's a bad thing. And I would be a bad father. And so we've got to trust God the Father to say, this is in your, this is in your hands. But I'm going to not stop asking until I get an answer. I'm going to be a woodpecker. And I'm just going to keep going. Anybody out there had a woodpecker at your house? I have. They don't stop. They go through your stucco. Then they go through your backing, which is styrofoam. Then they get into the netting. And then they just don't ever stop until you do what? Plunk them. They don't stop. But this is cool. Anybody ever done that with God? You're like, you started praying, praying, praying. You never got an answer really. But because you didn't get an answer, you gave up. Don't give up. If you have a son or daughter here this morning who doesn't know Jesus Christ yet, you keep asking every day. If you have a real need, you have something in your life that you're like, I, until I get an answer, I am not going to stop. Then you keep praying. But if you get that answer, and it's not what you wanted, I would ask you to be humble and say, not my will, but yours be done. Dr. Daniel Henderson says this, a lack of prayer is my declaration of my independence from God. If you don't pray, if you never pray, if your prayers are only, God help me, if that's all you ever pray, then I'm here to tell you, your lack of a prayer life is you telling God, I'm good. I got three refrigerators. I don't need your heavenly storehouses. And that's not something any of us want to, want to say or do. Verse 11, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? God is perfect, and he will do much more than sinful men can do. We must be people of prayer. We must be people who, according to Philippians 4, 6, be anxious for nothing, but in everything 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. God wants to hear from you. He wants to build a relationship with you. He doesn't just want you to ask either. He wants you to spend time with him. He wants you to seek his face. He wants you to praise him. He wants you to honor him. He wants his kingdom to break out in your life. My fear is God is far less concerned about my kingdom than I am about his kingdom. And I want to be about his kingdom. So we've, uh, you know, we pray all the time. Uh, Pastor Dave runs a prayer uh, group Sunday mornings early before church. You're always welcome to come. We gave out these mugs. If you were wondering, Pastor Dawson, I was noticing that mug that you were drinking from earlier. Is that a limited edition? Uh, where did you get this? If you don't know what this mug is, then you missed Back to Church Sunday. And you missed your free mug. And I just want to say for now, a small cash donation to Pastor Dawson's, we'll just call it like golf gear of, you know, $200 or more. I would love to just, I would love to get you in a mug today. So in all seriousness, if you were not here and you missed it, please, we've got a bunch of them out there. Would you take a mug home? And here's the point of the mug. One, you're going to use it for your prayer life. You're going to put this, when you use this mug, you're going to pray. You're going to sit down with God and you're going to pray. And I'm going to ask you, would you pray for Mountainside Community Church? Please, would you pray for your home church first? And second, would you pray for someone in your home church? Would you pray for someone? Maybe you don't know them yet. Maybe you want to get to know them. Maybe you know them. Maybe you know there's a need. Maybe you know there. I don't know what you know. But pray for someone in your home church. And then as you drink in the morning, you're hanging out in the evening, whatever it is, use your mug and just use this as a reminder. Father, I need to be a person of prayer. I need to be praying for these things. There's so much that, that can happen through prayer. I don't want to give up. I want to ask. I want to seek. I want to knock. I want to stay at this. I want to keep going. Please grab a mug, take it home, and use it as a part of your prayer life. We're going to, uh, let me pray as the worship team comes forward. Um, we're going to close out with a couple songs. And then um, I'm going to pray for our food and then I will uh, give you instructions on how you can get the delicious chili, especially mine. And, um, and then I'll pray us out.
I will reach the end by grace and grace alone. If there's anything that I, we at Mountainside staff, elders want to tell you is we live in a dispensation of grace. We need to show one another more and more grace and love each and every day. So I will pray for the food. You're going to go um, out these doors. There's cups. Uh, get your chili. And then we're eating out where we ate for the baptism. Weather's perfect. Um, we have a panel of people who are voting on the winning chili. Um, they already know which one's mine. And so um, you just eat. Enjoy yourself. Uh, say hi to someone who maybe you don't know. Uh, make sure and, and sit and chat and fellowship. And uh, let me pray. Father God, I do thank you for this morning. I thank you for each and every person who's here. Uh, Father, we love them, but most importantly, you love them. <clears throat> we thank you for this food and for the fellowship uh, that we can have together. Uh, of all the things that we do, uh, this very much looks like the early church, uh, where some would have actually brought food because others uh, probably didn't have food. And so uh, when we come together in fellowship, we declare that we do need one another, that we do love one another, and that we actually are a body, that the foot is no better than the hand, is no better than the head, that we love and serve and sacrifice for one another. Thank you for your love and for your grace. Help us to be a people of prayer. It's in God's, it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Amen.